I'm so excited for this series called The Good Life. Uh, and so I have a question this morning that I want to start us off. Who has an area of their life that they're just praying for more in? Maybe it's more in your finances, or maybe it's more in opportunities, or maybe it's more in your spiritual life. You want to grow in the area of prayer. I, I, I bet that every, if I sat down and had coffee with everybody in this room, every single person would have an area where they want more. Amen? And one of the most amazing things about being a person of faith is that when we say yes to Jesus and we join the people of God, we serve a God of more. I, uh, I was, as I was preparing for this message, I was talking to my mom the other day, and I, and, and I remembered that there was a, uh, a uh, um, I've been, who's been, who has watched the documentary called The Last Dance, the Michael Jordan documentary? Amazing documentary. So I've, I've seen it. If you have not seen it, it's amazing. And the point of the documentary is that it follows the bulls and the 1997 Bulls team with Michael Jordan uh, for his sixth championship. And that was going to be the last uh, season that Michael would play. And I remember uh, that as I've been watching it, I've, I've had flashbacks of me at eight years of age. Because I was born in 89. So, 97, I was eight, I think. Even Nine. And I remember at that time, I was like a real big basketball guy. I was in NJB, how many NJB people, National Junior Basketball League, and, and I was a big fan of Allen Iverson, right? And I remember these Iversons came out, and, and uh, I had developed a reputation among my friends as that shoe kid. See what I'm talking about? Like the, the kid that just loved basketball shoes. And, and so I remember that the, these Iversons had come up, these uh, Allen Iversons who played for the Philadelphia 76ers had just dropped, and I wanted them so bad, and so I started like hustling my mom for money. Who's ever done that as a kid? Like you, you have something that you really want, you want that more in a certain part of your life, and you start kind of finding creative ways to, to, to get it, and I remember I was like bugging my mom. I was full court pressing her for her to buy these expensive shoes. And at the time, they were like $120, which is a lot today. But when I was that age, like due to inflation, that was like $11 billion, right? Because like how many remember the world before inflation? And I, and, and I remember I, I, I was bugging my mom for so long and she for the longest time refused to buy them. And I, and I remember being like, mom, like why? Won't you buy me these shoes? And she said, because you don't take care of the shoes that I've given you. And so that was a tough one to hear as a kid, right? And it also kind of went in one ear and out the other. And so I, I started to promise my mom, like, mom, don't worry. Like, I'll take care of these shoes, I promise. Like, I'll, I'll take care of them in such a way that it will shock you. So I, I started to barter with her and negotiate. And anyone who knows me know, knows me knows that I, I can be a little bit like that. And so I just started negotiating. I said, "Okay, I promise, I promise, I promise. I will. I, I bet my integrity on this. I will take care of these shoes if you just get them for me." And so I remember that it was like an occasion. My mom picked me up from school, and and we went to the mall and and I had my my sneakers picked out and I bought them and we took photos it was adorable right and 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 so I remember I got these shoes and and so I was so excited and I had them and and we had a van because my dad's from Sweden and and so he was he always even though he was a guy he always drove vans because of their practicality has everyone ever seen one of those guys that was my father uh, he's watching right now and um and I remember I got these shoes, and so we got home, and my mom went in the house, and a friend of mine uh, wanted to play basketball, and so I jumped out, and of course I started playing basketball with these new, brand new, $120 white shoes. Someone say, bad idea. <laughs> and so I remember I played, and I kid you not, I lasted about four minutes and so the ball hit the rim and bounced, and right by the house, there was a little plot of dirt. You know how when you have, like, these track homes, right, and they give it to you with dirt, like, because we just moved in, there wasn't any, like, garden, any, anything yet? And so, it, and it had, the sprinklers had just gone on, so it wasn't dirt, it was mud. 
And so I remember my little old nine-year-old self went up to grab this basket and just jumped in the mud and my shoe went like three inches deep. And I freaked out. It was so bad. And I remember the, t- the sheer terror and the horror. Number one, of destroying these amazing shoes. But number two, the wrath of my mother. Come on, somebody. And so I, I started, I didn't know what to do. I started freaking out. And I think my dad was there. And he was outside. And he just started laughing. And my mom was inside, and, and he kind of looked at me like, yeah, good luck with that one, buddy. Like, you're going to have to, you on your own. I ain't taking this shot for you. And so I, I, I went to the hose, and I started cleaning it off, and I was, like, madly trying to save my right shoe. And I remember that I, I got it clean enough, and I walked in, and I was like, oh, I'm going to lie to my mom. I'm going to try to get by her. So I walked in. Oh, yeah, these shoes are amazing. And then she said, stop right there, honey. And she turned around and looked right at the shoe. And right where the seam of the shoe, they have, a, they have what do you call it, like a white, um, yeah, a white stitch. And the white stitch was brown. And she looked at me and said, what did you do with these st-? And I... It was not great. And after that, I just kind of blacked out. Like, I didn't know what happened. It wasn't good. Something happened. Right? I don't know. I I woke up the next day at school. It was crazy. Yeah. And I'll never forget this because I I remember it was a a real lesson. and, And my mom would never let me live that down. So for like eight years... Every time I needed to buy something, she would say, well, you, you better not do what you did with those Iversons. <laughs> and and I, I learned such a valuable lesson that day because the moral of the story is simple, is that when we want more in life, it starts by what we do with our less. Many people in the world want to live a good life. But there are principles that the scripture gives us on how to live that life. And so there are four keys that the Bible gives us on how to organize ourselves, behaviors, plays that we can run. And so that's what we're going to be discussing this month. And so key number one is the key to more is taking care of less. Translation, do not do what I did with those Iversons because it will lead to nothing but cheap shoes for about 10 years. And I want to read this. Luke 16, 10. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. I love this because what we do in the small is always what you'll do in the big. I, uh, for those of you who do not know, I do uh, executive coaching with my Uncle Tim pretty often and and. And it's really cool because we get to work with people who are often getting promoted in leadership positions. So it's like someone who did great at their job, right? And then they get in a new job. And and so we're always looking at research and and, uh, about how people learn, how people develop, how people can be successful. And, And so one interesting statistic that I found that I thought was so fascinating is that everybody wants more money, right? Everyone believes that if they were given a lot of money, their life would be easier, but they did this really interesting study where they, they looked at people that had won the lottery. And what they found was that regardless of how much a person has won, 70% of people spent all of it within two years. And 50% ended up in more debt than when they started. Isn't that wild? It doesn't matter how much. So they looked at people that won $500,000, $5 million, $15 million, some of those like Mondo jackpot winners, right? You always see the crazy number. 70% of people that win the lottery lose all the money within two years. That's a crazy statistic. And so what that shows is if you want more in your life, the first step that the Bible tells us how to live is stewardship. How you take care of less 
opens up the door for more. And it's a, it's a powerful, powerful lesson. And you see it everywhere. I just recently met with my buddy Stephen Bellissimo, who is the best man at my wedding. He's watching right now. And so he's our wealth financial planner. He works for Merrill Lynch. And so I was talking to him about, about uh, you know, finances, right? And I said, okay, if you could give me any piece of advice, what would it be? And he said, the key to financial wealth building he goes, I work with a lot of clients. He has some clients that are at $100 million plus in net worth. That's like big money. And he says, the key with folks that do super well over time, they're all savers. And they're savers at every level. So you would think that like rich people at $100 million a year, that I said, how do people save? And, and, and I thought maybe it was like zero one year, right? And the next year was two million or when a big contract is, they save a lot. And he says, no, 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 That on average, if you look at any one of our clients, each of them are great at saving regularly. So I thought that was interesting that, that, that when it comes to money or when it comes to other areas of our lives, what we do with the small adds up to be really, really big. And so if there's an area in your life that you want more in, the best way to kickstart that more is to take care of the less you do have. Take care of what you have in front of you. I love that. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. Point number two. And I believe if you get this in your spirit... This will save you like 10 years. This is one of the most profound lessons I've ever learned as a human being in the area of wisdom. More responsibility, the more ability you have to prosper. The more responsibility you're willing to take in a given situation, the more ability that you have to grow, the more. Proverbs 14, 23, all hard work brings a profit, but mere talk leads to to only poverty. One of the things that I love so much in the Bible is that when God created human beings, when he created Adam and Eve, the first thing that God did was he named Adam. Well, what does that mean? Why is that meaningful? Because in the Jewish literary tradition, when you name something, you gave it a purpose, a function, and a responsibility. So when God comes to Adam and he names Adam, what he's doing is the first act God gives us as people is he gives us responsibility. He gives us a function. He gives us a form. He gives us a position. And so the more responsibility we take on in a given area, the more agency you have. This is where I think that like we live in a, an anti-responsibility world. Who feels this way? Like it's like it literally, it's like we promote as a culture anti-responsibility. It's all about choices, right? And so I feel like that's the general general uh, message that we give to a lot of young people. That it's about like don't burden your life up with responsibility. Like give yourself the freedom to move around and make choices. Well, that's great when you're 20, but what they don't tell you is that opportunities increase with the amount of responsibility you take. It's wild how true this is. Like you can literally draw a line between how, many, how much opportunity a person has and how much responsibility they've taken on. And it's a straight line. And so if you want to increase responsibility, if you want to increase opportunity in a given area of your life, the more you take on responsibility. If you want less agency, less say, less of a, a way to move forward, then the best thing to do is to blame somebody else. <laughs> think about it. Just think about it from a, a psychological point of view as well as a biblical point of view is that the first thing that God does to human beings after he creates us is he gives us the responsibility to be his stewards in the world. Well, why? Because he gives us the position so that we can have the freedom to. 
Because when you're given position and you have a position, you have authority. And folks with authority have agency. And agency means you have opportunity, choices, capacity, the ability to set the conditions for more to come in a given area. They did this really interesting study recently, and, and, it's, and they, were studying, um, they were studying college kids that dropped out. It's very interesting because there's a certain percentage of kids that go to college that drop out. And so they did this thing called future authoring. And so what they did was they took kids who were entering college and they had them for 90 minutes write out what they wanted to do in their future. Just 90 minutes. So it was a set of questions. Where do you want your life to be in five years? Where do you want your life to be in 10 years? And what they found that that 90 minute exercise dropped or lowered the amount of kids dropping out of college by 50%. It was the single most meaningful thing. What's a crazy thing? It's because a little vision and some responsibility to that vision means big, big things in the future. And so we are built to be aiming creatures in the world. God creates us. He gives us authority. He gives us responsibility. And the more we step into that, the more we realize that we are responsible to be agents of change in our family, in our lives, in our church, in our community. What happens is that more begins to come when we step up and step out. Amen? And so if there's an area of your life where you want more in, key number one is take on responsibility. Say, you know what? I don't know what to do, but I'm going to turn this around. You know what? I don't know how to reorganize my family, but I'm going to take the responsibility as the prayer warrior in my family. You know, I don't know how we're going to figure this out financially, but I'm going to take the responsibility in my family to learn finances, to be a financial force for good through generosity. I want to, I'm going to be the person in my family to cultivate a culture of generosity and giving and of service in my family. When we take on that position, opportunities increase dramatically. And so the one thing you want to do always in life is where can I take a little bit more responsibility? Because the more responsibility you take, the more your territory expands. There's an amazing scripture in the Bible, and this is point number three. And this is 2 Corinthians 9, 6. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. 2 Corinthians 9, 6. Small seeds reap big harvests. 80% of your life are small, repeatable habits that you do every day. Isn't that crazy? If you add up 24 hours in your life and you look at the time you're awake and then you look at the time that you spend repeating breakfast, lunch, dinner, workouts, going to work, going home to work, whatever podcast you listen to, that show you like, Selling Sunset. Come on, somebody. 80% of our lives are repeatable behaviors. And so what that means is that small decisions add up to be big, big harvests. My uncle likes to say it like this. He says that every day you start out with a bag of seeds. And so you have an opportunity to sow good seeds or bad seeds. And so if you sow good seeds on a daily basis, what ends up happening is that you will begin to set the conditions for great things to happen in every area of your life. It's an amazing thing. And it could be super, super simple. Uh, one of the things that, that uh, we've done, uh, myself and, and Callie as a married couple, is uh, we will cook for each other. We'll cook for each other. That's like, that's like the move as a dude. Cook for your woman. 
Be good at cooking, I'm telling you. And we, we, last night we were cooking a steak and I was showing Callie how to cook steaks because that's kind of been my area in the repertoire of uh, different things that we do, right? And so she's really good at beef stroganoff. I'm the steak guy, Who's ever, whoever has this in their rela in relationship. There's always like a grill master and someone great like in the other parts of the kitchen. And so what we do is we break it up. And so yesterday we were cooking a steak and I was showing her how to get the sear on it because you got to have a good sear on the steak. But we were cooking it inside the house and we didn't open up any of the windows and our apartment is brand new. And so the whole alarm system just started going off like crazy. And it was so loud and the neighbors were banging on windows. It was wild. And I, I remember that... It was so funny that because we were, I was trying to show Callie how to cook this steak, and the first time I did it, nothing worked. And we had all this smoke, but to my defense, the steak was good. And, and one of the things that was so great about that was that, that in life, if you have a relationship, finding things you can do, small things, end up being big aspects of your relationship. And so that's something we practice all the time. We, we just cook for each other. Honey, I can see you're tired. Let me just cook for you. And then I get points. See, there's a point system for all you single people. You guys don't know that yet. You think it's all unconditional love, right? Oh, baby, I'd love you. I have, we have this joke with, I have this joke with my wife that, that with, um, that she always says, you know, I'd love you no matter. And I go, yeah, but I'm a dude. So, like, I don't totally believe that. Does that, does that make sense? Like, I kind of believe it. Like, I know that you love me. <laughs> but I'm not convinced that you would love me closely if I started not doing my hair and lost my job and spent, like, 10 years. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like... Like, every dude knows this. Like, love is always a little conditional for men. Like, I know you'll love me, but if I don't get my act together, you'll probably love me from afar in about seven years. <laughs> and so it's the little things. And so what's true in relationships is true in life. And I love this in 2 Corinthians because it's so clear, is that when we, we reap what we sow, so when we sow sparingly, and I love this. We get sparingly. When we, when we reap, when, when we sow bountifully, we reap bountifully. And so when I hear this, I, I hear, what I hear is responsibility. That in life, we have a choice to see ourselves as a sower. And we sow in all kinds of ways. Because sowing basically just means investing in. That's what it means. So when we, for, to give you an example, when we give and we sow our tithes and offering, what we're doing is we're investing in a church that will be around for our children's children. That's what we're doing. We see the world and we see people and we see people now and in the future. And we, when we give, what we're doing is we are ensuring through provision that there are Christians in this city who are movers and shakers. That there is a house of God people can come to, they can find freedom, they can discover their purpose, they can grow in influence. Every time we give, every time we sow, every time we serve, when we pray for this church, when we show up, we just had this amazing prayer ministry this morning. We were praying for this church. We were praying for every single person that, that would be touched by this church. That there were families that needed this church to grow. That, 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 there was, that there was me as a pastor, but there would be eventually a future pastor. That we were going to build a generational church. And so all of our collective work... When we give, what we're doing is we are taking on the responsibility to be the provision so that the church could exist for our kids. When we worship together, what we are doing is we're bringing in the presence of God and we are making an investment in our spiritual future. And so that's a form of responsibility. And so that's why I believe that 
The fastest way to see spiritual more in your life is when you start serving and giving. Because when you take on that responsibility, what you're saying is you're saying, I'm not going to be a passive person. What I'm going to do is I'm going to step up and recognize that I am a force in this world. That's what we need, I think, as Christians. I think so many Christians today in our culture, it's almost like a two-year Christian. It's like we've built all these big churches, right, to get people to that two-year position. But what we need are we need churches that build leaders. Because when we have a church full of leaders, what we do is we have a church full of power. Because that's what a leader is. A leader is someone who leads. They're better off. They, they function in such a way where the people below them and above them are better off. And so that's why you can lead at every level. And I love this because leadership starts with small moments of responsibility. And what's so fascinating is that the more responsibility you take, the stronger you'll get. I was talking to this therapist that specialized in anxiety. They were dealing with people who had anxiety and phobias. And so this is common. One third of people deal with anxiety. Who's ever had a moment of anxiety? I've had a moment of anxiety in my life. And so what they found was that they, I, I was so interested in, and, and I wanted to know, like, how do you treat people with crippling fear or anxiety? And they said, well, in therapy, you, there's nothing we can do that can take away the fear. And that was like eye-opening. Okay, so I'm not crazy to feel a little fearful. So you're not crazy because you're scared of something. That's just part of life. He goes, but what we can do through exposure therapy is make someone braver. And this was interesting because, well, why? Well, how does this work? And, and the therapy, exposure therapy is very simple. It, it basically means if someone's scared of something, for instance, say that they're scared of spiders or, 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 or something in their life or elevators or, or whatever it is, Exposure therapy says that if you take that fear and you break it into 50 small pieces and then you voluntarily get the person to expose themselves to their fear, like look at a picture of an elevator and then walk out and see a real elevator and then go 30 feet and then go 20 feet, what happens is that the person gets braver over time because they begin, they see themselves succeeding. They see themselves acting courageously. And then eventually, what happens is the person builds up so much courage that they actually confront what they're really fearful of. And when they do, they're usually cured for life. Isn't that interesting? And so the reason why is because you can't take away fear, but we can make ourselves braver. And when we, we get braver, when we confront what we're fearful of, what happens is that our confidence increases. And so that's why responsibility is so crucial to development in our world. And it's such an amazing key that opens up more because when you see yourself as important, you're too important. You're too important not to face this fear. You're too important not to grow. You're too important not to be a leader. You're too important to your family. When you recognize how important you are, and then you begin to step out in that importance, what happens is that it just leads to more. It unlocks the door of more. Because what happens is with every step, Every time you give and it's weird, what happens is you realize you go from this is odd to I'm a participator. Then you go from I'm a participator to I'm a giver. Then you go from I'm a giver to I'm a builder. Then you go from I'm a builder to where I go, people get better. I bring influence. And this is point number four, and then if the worship can come up. The more territory we tend, someone say, I have territory. The more God gives. 1 Peter 4.10, each of you should use whatever gift you have received 
to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. The moment my life began to really shift in the area of opportunity was through service. This is a personal note. I became a pastor when I was 27 years of age. So I was in my mid-20s and like all mid-20 year old people, the future is uncertain and you're usually a little insecure. Who's ever been there? It's like 20s, right? Because you don't know. But I learned, and I remember the day I, was, uh, I had a really bad bout with anxiety. And I like to talk about this because a lot of people have anxiety. And so I think it's good that we're open about anxiety because it, it, it naturalizes our ability to talk about it. And so roughly around uh, five or six years ago, I had really bad anxiety, like crippling anxiety. And so I, I, I had to go to therapy like three times a week just to, to kind of make it. And I, I actually had to, I, was, I stayed with two weeks with my mother because my anxiety was so severe. And, and I remember that I was on her couch and I didn't know what to do because I was anxious and I had no strategy of getting through my situation. And I remember that I was praying and I received this word that hit me like an arrow. And ever since I heard this, I just took off running. And I remember that I was, I was praying about my future and, and, and I felt like God wanted me to write a five-year vision script. And so what I did was I wrote what my life would be like in five years, how I wanted it to be. And then I wrote what my life would look like in five years if I stayed on my trajectory. And it was not great. I had an amazing vision, but then I also realized that, man, if I didn't fix some things, I'm going to be stuck five years from now. And in my prayer life, I've, I remember I went to Scripture and, and I, I felt God so clearly revealed to me, Stefan, the mistake you're making is that you don't think you matter enough. You don't realize how important you are to that vision. That the only way that what you want to see will happen in your family and in your church and in your life is if you realize how much you matter and you step up off this couch and you start working on yourself and you start working out of this. And I remember that it hit me so hard but also like a velvet glove and I believe it was the spirit because I had so much anxiety but I also felt like I understood who I was and I understood where God wanted me to go and I realized that I was not the man I needed to be to handle that yet. And I remember I was talking to my dad who's watching this. And I said, I have some work I got to do to get myself to the man I need to be. But it's my responsibility. I'm going to do it. And the more responsibility I took, the more I realized what God had put in me. And it's amazing when you listen to the voice of God that he provides everything you'll ever need. And so I think there are people in this room, God brought you here today just so someone can tell you the key to the more you need is in you taking responsibility. Yes. And it might be scary. But I promise you that if you do, God will show up in a big way and his super is going to hit your natural and you're going to have so much more in that part of your life. It's going to shock you. I'm done preaching. Let's give the Lord a clap. If everybody can get up. Yeah. And I just want to pray before this worship song. You know, one of the things that we are at this church is we want to be a house of freedom. Every area of your life there are things that you need broken off of you. And maybe you're a person that, 
that is coming here and you're saying, Pastor Stefan, I want more of Jesus in my life. I want more God in my life. I want more freedom in my life. And if that's you, if you just bow your heads and, and pray with me. And, and also for those, I want to extend invitation. If you're, if you're here today and you're saying, Pastor Stefan, I want more Jesus in me. I want to live for Jesus. I want to lay down my life to, for Jesus. This, this more you're talking about, this abundance, I want that to be my life. Just pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for creating me and giving me life. Thank you for sending your son to change my life. Jesus, be Jesus in me. I say yes to your invitation to live a good life. In Jesus' name. Let's give a clap for everybody who, who prayed for freedom. And let's just worship God. Let's take two minutes and let's press into Jesus this morning. Your goodness is ready now to He's ready now to me Cause your goodness is ready now to He's ready now to me With my life laid down I'll surrender now I'll give you everything Cause your goodness is ready now to He's ready now to me and all my life, and all my life, you have been faithful. And all my life, you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will see. And all my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will see of the goodness of God Your goodness is running up to, is running up to me. Cause your goodness is running up to, is running up to me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I'll give you everything. Cause your goodness is running up to, is running up to me. I don't know about you guys, but I'm loving the good life. Can we give Pastor Stefan another clap as he opened us up? This is just part one, you guys. How many of you want more of the good yes. life, the goodness that God has to offer in your lives, in our life, in the congregation family? As I said earlier, don't run out, stick around. What I didn't mention is we actually have a lot of cake for our graduates today. Not just for the graduates, for the entire church. So don't run out, be sure to grab some cake. And then also what we're gonna do today, we don't wanna miss this opportunity. If you're a junior high or a high school kid, we wanna meet with you immediately after service. Myself, my great friend Chris, we have a special treat for you guys. But we also want to pray for you guys, okay? So parents, if you have a junior high or a high school kid, please, I beg you, don't let them run out. Send them over. We're going to meet where we met last time. Blue umbrellas back as you uh, exit out to the left. Blue umbrellas. We want to pray. We want to talk to them. And we want to believe that the best is yet to come for our junior high and our high school kids. If you believe that this morning, let's give the Lord a huge clap. So as we press into our week, you guys, let's remember this good life, this goodness that God has promised us. And let me pray for us before we exit this morning. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord. We thank you for the congregation family. 
We thank you for Pastor Stefan and his message this morning. We thank you for this good life, this God life, this goodness that you're pursuing us, Father God. You're not mad at us. You're mad about us. And we just thank you for your endless pursuit, no matter where we're at, that you are tracking us down, Father. You are tracking us down so we can fulfill your mission, your purpose, our individual callings, Father God. So I pray a special blessing over each and every one of us as we leave today, Father God, that we step in to this goodness that you have called us to do, to be, to act, to share. Lord, you have us all in the palm of your hand. You know the number of hairs you have, that we have on our head, Father God. You know the beginning from the end, Lord. We just thank you for your goodness. We acknowledge you for your goodness, Father God. Let us go on our way this morning, Father God, and let us just do your will. Let us be agents of change. Let us be ambassadors and influencers for your kingdom, Father God. And remember, you've given us a responsibility to reach out and to invite others so they can experience the goodness of God. And all of God's precious people said this morning, amen.